A quick announcement that I did forget about. There is spin tonight. Uh, your temporary youth pastor has been sick for some time. His whole family's been smitten with this flu. So I understand there is spin, and I think our, our fallbacks, Caleb and Elise, will be kind of... Yeah, okay, we're good. So it's on. Very good. Um, and just an update on our coming associate pastor. It looks like their arrival date is going to be between Christmas and New Year's. So we're shooting for that week for them to travel over the pass with all their belongings and get settled into the parsonage. So that's just a quick update with our associate pastor, Tyler Paris. We are going to be turning our attention to a Christmas scene for the next several weeks, and I would like to begin in Malachi. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, and I'd like to read the first six verses of this prophetic declaration. God spoke through the prophet Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of the Lord of his coming? And who can stand where he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fullness, or fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purify of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan. And those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we spend this time in worship of you around the voice of our God, around the authority of your word to us, I pray that your spirit will be active and present to give us understanding and clarity of thought that we can clearly see the majesty of our God and the glory of your redemption in the sending of your Son. We are so grateful, Father, for the work of the Spirit to open our eyes to see by faith and repentance, to be transformed, to be born again by the work of your good hand so that we can see the glory of the cross of Jesus Christ. And that gives a depth of meaning to the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ. It gives to the church an understanding of the birth of our Savior that the rest of the world has not yet comprehended. And we pray that as a church, we'll be faithful to proclaim that gospel truth, proclaim the light of Christ, so that there will be those that do believe and trust in you as your Savior through the working of your good hand. So transform us, we pray, Father, but we pray also that you prepare us to be a light and a witness for Jesus Christ and the world around us. In Christ we pray. Amen. Well, surrounding our Christmas season, and I think I mention this every year, there are just a host of traditions, and most of you, like myself, we like those Christmas traditions, but believer and unbeliever alike enjoy those traditions as well. But among the Christians, there's a number of differing spiritual traditions, if I can put it in that context that express, express the believer's joy, the believer's satisfaction at the coming of God's Son. And many of these traditions, you know, are not directed on the church by the Word of God. But nonetheless, there is something that spiritually moves us about these traditions as we focus the attention on the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we practice these traditions not out of obedience to the Word of God because they're not directed by Scripture, but we practice them out of our praise to God for what he's done. And as this sermon title implies, one of those traditions that some Christians, many Christians, celebrate is Advent. It's that season that leads up to December 25. And of course, December 25 is not that which is ordained by Scripture either. But the Advent speaks about the coming of. It, it, it points us to the, the event itself. 
And December 25 represents in some sense that event, the event being the, the nativity itself or the birth of Jesus Christ. And I know that people celebrate Advent in differing ways. Some of you have calendars, Advent calendars. I know at this church we used to do Advent calendars. There was a wreath with four calendars. I can't even tell you what, what those four uh, ca uh, candles represent. But some of you have celebrated the, the candles or the wreath of Advent. Others appreciate Advent with Christmas trees and lights and stuff like that. But the birth itself, which is the nativity, is the actual circumstances, the time. It, it represents the, the people involved in the birth of the Savior. And some of us, as we celebrate Advent, it includes concerts or musicals or plays, decorations. But the Word of God also gives to us its own Advent with regard to this nativity. It is the preparation that God himself arranged for the birth of Messiah. Not only did the Old Testament prophets, like Malachi, foretell Christ's coming, but God sovereignly directed the, the lives of individuals. He sovereignly directed the circumstances to make his son's entrance take place exactly as he intended. And this is what I'd like to examine this year. I come to this season... I, I look at messages perhaps that I haven't done before or I haven't spent maybe as much time on before. And I think in regard to Luke chapter 1, which is where we're going to go this morning and for the next several weeks, <clears throat> we all understand that those things are part of the Christmas story. But I also believe individuals like Elizabeth and Zacharias and even John the Baptist, they're almost presented as a footnote to the Christmas story. But we're going to see they're more than that. They're an essential part of the nativity. This is God's advent. This is how God prepared for the coming or the birth of his son. And I think we're going to see as we move, and I hope we see as we move through our text this week and in the coming weeks, that the handprint of God is all over the advent, even as it is with the nativity. It's the sovereignty of God, the providence of God that is being unveiled before us. And I think the theme that's going to be presented here, and I'm going to do it at the end, is that salvation is all of God. It is all of him. And it is seen in how God works in the lives and prepares for the birth of his son. It's how he brings his son into the world in miraculous, unique ways, in ways that man could not accomplish. This is all of God's salvation is all of the Lord. And what should be awe-inspiring to us in this account is that God has cast a set of players that are going to be part of this movement, this sovereign hand of God. We're going to see some of that cast this morning in three individuals, and I'm going to throw in a fourth as well, Elizabeth, Zacharias, and their baby son, John. And the angel Gabriel. Those are the four main players that we're going to see this morning. And I'd like to begin our study of the advent of Christ by reading Luke chapter 1. So turn in your Bibles to, to Luke chapter 1. And I'm only going to read 20 verse, 21 verses here. Verse 5 to verse 25. So join me in Luke chapter 1 beginning to verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea. There was a priest named Zacharias, one of the division of Abiah, and his wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, According to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him the name of John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor, 
and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn away many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife has advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and yet remained a mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant. She kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. This is where we're going to begin our study of the birth of Christ. It's the advent that God has prepared. And the honorable cast of characters that we see as players that God chose to prepare his way for his son will be part of our study this morning. While it's true that we generally recognize that God um, used Zacharias and Elizabeth and they're part of the Christmas story, I think it is also true that we may only give passing notice when it comes to our recognition and celebration of the nativity. And yet, if you will note, going all the way through Luke chapter 1, there's nearly twice as many verses that Luke gives to the advent in Luke chapter 1 as he gives to the actual nativity or the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2. There are some 80 verses here in the opening before Christ ever enters the story of Luke or the account of Luke. The birth, that tells us, I believe, that there's something significant about this advent or about this preparation of God. The birth of John the Baptist was officially the break of the prophetic silence between heaven and Israel that had lasted for some 400 years. And Gabriel's announcement here to Zacharias was the first word from God that Israel had heard since the prophet Malachi, who foretold of John's coming. John would be then the final Old Testament prophet sent by God to call his people back from their sin, from their self-righteousness, from their false religiosity, from their self-achieving view of salvation. John was the final Old Testament prophet. And John the Baptist would be the final Old Testament prophet that would point the way of God's people to repentance and faith in the one true Savior, and the only one that alone can provide salvation and eternal hope. For generations, Israel had forsaken God. They had forsaken God's laws. They had turned to idolatry. They had turned to the immorality of the nations around them. And when Messiah came into the world, Israel had returned to temple worship. But it was not a true worship of God. Herod, who is a prominent figure in the nativity, and we're not going to spend much time with Herod this morning, but he is a prominent figure in the birth of Christ. He had built this, or rebuilt this magnificent temple in Jerusalem. And it is said that much of the eastern wall of the temple was overlaid with gold so that when the sun rose in the east, it would shine, would have shown on that eastern wall, and the glory of the temple would be broadcast throughout the Kidron Valley. Herod was a magnificent architect and builder, though he was a ruthless man. And that temple that he had built for Israel was his way of ingratiating himself with the Jews, which was only for selfish purposes. But nonetheless, that temple symbolized Israel's perceived faithfulness to and high standing with God. And I say perceived because they were not faithful to God, And they did not have a high standing with the Lord. 
but they attributed their devotion to keep the laws of Moses as their salvation. But this was not the assessment of God. Isaiah 9 speaks to the coming of Messiah at a time when the land was in darkness. The people walked in darkness. That's God's assessment of Israel when Messiah came. The people were not devoted to the Lord. They were not walking in the ways of the Lord. This was a dark land, and men were walking in the darkness of their sin. If you look at the end of Luke chapter 1, Zacharias is filled with the Holy Spirit following the birth of his son John, and he prophesied of the Messiah's coming with these words in verse 78 and 79 of Luke 1. He prophesied because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. Typical of humanity, Israel believed themselves to be quite righteous and on good terms with God, yet the word declares those days to be dark times, and the sentence of death was on the people of Israel. Messiah then is entering the scene in these prophetic words, like the sunrise. And you can see or envision in your mind the sun peeking over the hills and starting to shine on the temple and the gleam of the temple, which represented the presence of God, would have been on the land. This is the coming of Messiah on a dark land. It would be God's Messiah and him alone that would bring the hope of eternal life to a people that was marked by death. And part of the tragic scene, this pre-Christ scene, is that God had prophesied of the necessity of one to come and prepare for the, the coming of Christ. Just a man that was needed to come and prepare the hearts of the people tells us the condition of Israel when Messiah arrived. Somebody had to come and prepare this people for the Messiah's arrival. The condition of mankind, even Israel, so dark, so bleak, that God said, it's essential that I send somebody to prepare this people for the coming of my son. And this is where Zacharias and Elizabeth would enter God's plan. They were appointed by the Lord to bring God's messenger into the land before the birth of Christ. Even the name Zacharias was prophetic in that it means the Lord has remembered The Lord has remembered. Zacharias is the priest that is letting the people know God has remembered, number one, his promise to send a Messiah, to send a Savior to his people, but also that God remembered the prayers of these two old people that have walked faithfully with the Lord. As is so true of the Lord God, he accomplishes his purposes in ways that confound our understanding. And this is what we need to see in the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth in preparing for the coming of Christ. In the advent that God had determined and planned, the fingerprint of God is all over this. This story is a story of miracles. And this was a matter uh, of importance to to Zacharias and Elizabeth. They wanted a child. In in their youth, they had hoped to have children and a family like other Hebrew families. But it says in Scripture that Elizabeth was barren as a young woman. And by this time, she's now an old woman and beyond the ability to bear children. Here's where the miracle comes. Here's where the supernatural (laughs) arrives. Here's where God puts his stamp upon this scene. This is something only I can do, God is declaring. And for a Jewish couple to not be able to have children was viewed as God's punishment for some sin or a lack of faithfulness. And you can even hear the shame that Elizabeth experienced from her own words in that 25th verse. She saw her condition as a disgrace. And yet we see from our story the fact that Elizabeth was barren and now an older woman beyond ability to have children. That was part of God's plan. He determined it that way. In other words, John had to be a product of the power of God. It had to be a miracle. And the text tells us that far from being unfaithful, 
Zacharias and Elizabeth were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord, verse 6. So we're not looking at a couple that Israel may have seen as unfaithful to God. No, they were walking right before the Lord. So God determined that barrenness. He used that barrenness. And he waited until they were beyond the ability to have children. And this is what God says, now I will move. Why? It's so that we could see this is of God and God alone. Only he could do this. This man, John, is a supernatural work of the Spirit of God. And we're going to see that further in just a moment. These two believers, Zacharias and Elizabeth, stood out in the dark land in which they lived. And they were prepared by God to fill a unique role in the plan of his salvation, God's salvation. Now, Zacharias was a priest who served before the Lord in ministering to the people of Israel. And as with the custom, according to this text, the priests were separated into divisions. There were actually 24 of those divisions. And each division, each of those 24 divisions, num numbered about 300 priests. Twice a year, each of these divisions, each of these 24 divisions would come to serve at the temple for a week's time. In other words, each, each division would serve two weeks in the course of a year. Two one-week terms to serve in the temple in Jerusalem. And the privilege <clears throat> of offering the incense was an honor that only a few of the priests would ever experience. It's reported there's some 8,000 priests in Palestine at this time. So the priests that offered the incense in the temple in Jerusalem for that moment was selected for a highly honored task, but only once could they be selected, and only a few of those 8,000 would be chosen to do so. So they were selected, according again to our text, by lot, to enter the holy place, and Zacharias' name was drawn for that moment. The incense in the temple was kept burning continually so that the priests selected would offer the incense in the morning and in the evening so it was kept burning all the time. And he would enter the holy place of the temple where the golden altar of incense stood in front of the veil which separated the holy place from the holy of holies. So they had to enter very carefully because they were not allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. So they entered that holy place with great reverence and great care, and they would bring incense offering, lay it on the altar, and prepare it to be burned. And it was going to be burned at the exact moment that the other priests and the gathering of the faithful would take place out in the court of Israel. And they would begin to offer up their prayers at the moment that the priest would light the incense. And the symbolism is really rich here. In that offering, that incense offering, the vapors or the smoke or the aroma would rise up to heaven at the same time that the prayers of God's people would be lifted up to heaven. This is the moment that God chose to make a message known to Zacharias. This is the moment that God chose to send his angel Gabriel to announce what God was about to do through this faithful couple, this old, faithful couple that were well beyond bearing children. As a priest who walked in righteousness in the sight of God, Zacharias entered the holy place to offer the incense on the altar with a sense of reverence and worship for the honor of representing the prayers of God's people in this way. And what this, these verses show us is a man and his wife that were specifically chosen by God to fulfill a unique and honored role in the plan of God's redemption. It is also a clear demonstration of the sovereign hand of God working through events, working through these circumstances, working through these lives, the lives of God's chosen people to accomplish his purpose and for his glory. And what I hope we see here is that nothing is lost to God that comes under the hand of his work. Nothing is lost to him. We think of Elizabeth's disgrace. That is not lost to God. It was seen by the community of Israel as a disgrace. It was Elizabeth's disgrace. It was no doubt a disgrace even for Zacharias 
We have no children. Nothing to carry on the legacy of our family. But again, nothing is lost to the sovereign hand of God. He's using this. He's orchestrating this. He's working among this kind of problem, this kind of trouble to make his glory seen. And this brings us to verse 11, where we see an honorable calling that God gives to this honorable couple. In verse 11 to 17, an angel of God appeared to Zacharias while he's about to offer the incense on the altar. This angel is sent from heaven with a special message for Zacharias and for Elizabeth that would reveal the honorable calling that God had chosen for them. And even more important, God had chosen a highly honored calling for their son, John, their son that was to be named John. The hand of God is so clearly seen in the timing of these events and even the arrangement of every detail, including the casting of the lot which fell on Zacharias so he could be there for that moment, that honored moment. So we know right away that the offering of the incense is significant here. This is where the prayers of God's people are being offered up for their own sins, sins of repentance, sins of confession. They're praising God at this moment, thanking God for who he is. No doubt praying for the nation that it would be delivered from their enemy, even from Rome. And with that said, no doubt they're praying for the promise to be fulfilled that Messiah would now come. Because remember, Israel anticipated a Messiah that would deliver them from the clutches of their enemy. Here's a picture of God choosing Zacharias at, the, Zacharias at that moment to offer the incense at that moment. And then the angel's proclamation comes at that time. This tells us there's something significant about that offering of incense, the prayers of God's people going up. God had heard their prayers. God was listening. God was working through. God was sovereignly at work, even in the prayers of his people. And you can almost picture Zacharias entering the holy place, preparing the altar, and feeling the significance of his role in offering up this fragrance as the people of God gathered to pray. And verse 10 tells us that the people had already begun to pray and it was now time for him to lay the offering on the altar. It was then that Zacharias beheld this, the stunning presence of the angel of God. And we say stunning because the brilliance of this presence, the brilliance of this angel terrified Zacharias. He was troubled at the sight of the angel, gripped with fear. Verse 19, we learn that this angel was Gabriel, and he came to deliver the news that the prayers of this couple had been heard, and that God was going to grant them a son, and that son would be named John. So clearly the representation here in the offering of the incense included John and Elizabeth's prayer down through the years that they would have a son. And this would be a miraculous birth in that the Lord would have to come and open the womb of Elizabeth, who was not only barren as a younger woman, but who is now past the age of bearing children at all. Nonetheless, God had a unique plan for this couple. And Zacharias and Elizabeth had been chosen to parent the forerunner to the Messiah. And because this was a special work of God, Gabriel announces to them, you too, Zacharias and Elizabeth, you're going to have joy and gladness. And many will rejoice at his birth. Now this joy-filled statement alone tells us that though Israel was in darkness and sin, what did God intend to do here? He intended to turn the hearts of many back to himself so that many would rejoice over the birth of John. Now, if we jump ahead just a little bit, we need to take a look at John's ministry. Do you remember his ministry, his preaching? What was the theme of his preaching? It was repentance and confession of sin. This is not a man that came with a soft, pleasant, or easy digest kind of preaching that we might prefer today. And I was chuckling with Tim a little bit earlier that as we listened to the Sunday school account of Jonathan and 
shepherds and his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hand of Angry God, this is what came to mind, for me anyway. John the Baptist did not come with a pleasant message. He had the difficult task of exposing the sin and darkness in a people that God had plopped him into the midst of. A dark land, darkness of sin. And we are no different today, by the way. But he came to expose the sinful condition of Israel in preparation for what? The cross. Just for people to understand Christ Redeemer require them understanding their sin. It's going to require confession. So who are these ones that are going to rejoice over the birth of this kind of a preacher? Who are the ones that are going to sit under that kind of preaching and be happy about it? It is only those who have come to see their dreadful condition of sin before God. These are the ones who understand the darkness of sin and the judgment that awaits those who remain in the sin. And only those that see that darkness are going to be the ones that the Spirit of God is working, transforming their hearts to see, this is the trouble I'm in. This is my sin before holy God. This is the coming judgment against my sin. These ones that rejoice over the, the birth of John, these are the ones who have found eternal sanity satisfaction in the saving grace of God and the atoning work of his son. It is against the backdrop of our sin and only then do we see the glory of the light of the sunrise as it's coming up in the morning and his rays are breaking through the darkness. Those that see that light are those that have come to know the darkness of their sin. These are the ones, according to Gabriel's prophecy, that are going to rejoice at the birth of Zacharias and Elizabeth's son. Oh yes, they're going to have joy and gladness. God is going to grant them a child. But this child's going to come as a hard preacher. But there will be those that rejoice over that because they've been awakened to their sin, their need of a Savior, and they're going to see the glory of Messiah. And they're going to rejoice that they have been counted as those that have been redeemed by the Lamb of God. The child born to this faithful couple, they're going to prepare the way for Messiah by calling men to acknowledge their sin and turn in repentance to God. John, it says, would be great in the sight of the Lord. He would be set apart for God's purposes. And he would direct sinners to the Savior. It says that he would not drink alcohol, indicating the Nazarite vow that John would make, meaning that he would be separated by specific disciplines in life, and he would be fully devoted to serve the Lord God. But I think most unique about this man is that the Spirit of God would fill him while he was still in the womb. Now, when we started our study of Romans and we looked at Acts chapter 9, I remember saying, I don't know that there's a more clear declaration of conversion under the doctrine of election that we see in the Apostle Paul, but I think this might supersede it. To see that God has actually chosen John while he's still in the womb and the Spirit of God fills him, that embryo in the womb. I don't know that there is a more clear declaration of the doctrinal election there than maybe John the Baptist. Because the Spirit of God filled this one before he ever decided right from wrong, before he ever had an opportunity to make a choice for Christ, just using some of the language of our day. No, God chose him and filled John with his Holy Spirit before that child ever left the womb. This child set apart for the purposes of God, not only to be saved by God's grace, but to go out and proclaim the grace of God. This was an unprecedented promise, which explains why later the child would leap for joy in Elizabeth's womb when Mary greeted her as a pregnant woman with the Christ child in her womb. And the greatness of John would later be declared by Jesus in Matthew 11 and verse 11, where Jesus said, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there is not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. 
Now, looking back at the great spiritual leaders in Israel, that means not Abraham, not Moses, not King David, not Isaiah, not Elijah. None of them, according to Jesus, were as great as John the Baptist. How do we explain that? It has to be the presence of the Holy Spirit from the very moment he was conceived. This one was set apart for the purposes of God and given the privilege of preparing the way for God's own Son to enter our world as our Savior. This child's ministry for the Lord, under the power of the Holy Spirit, would reunite broken families, relationships, as the disobedient are called back to an attitude of righteousness. This would be his ministry. Now later again, when we look at Jesus preaching the gospel, he said, I'm going to come with a sword that's going to divide families. Some will embrace the saving grace of God. Others will have no part of it. But the gospel is also that which unites us together to trust in Christ. And John will have that kind of a ministry. As he preaches repentance, there will be father and son alike that are going to recognize the darkness of their sin under the ministry of this man who is filled with the Holy Spirit, making him the greatest of all preachers, the greatest of all prophets. The preaching ministry of John, the angel proclaims this more positive result as the sinful people of Israel respond to him in faith. John would make ready a people prepared for the Lord's coming. And the dark condition of Israel, though they were highly religious, and it's important for us to understand that, they had returned to temple worship, highly religious. Nonetheless, this is the dark land in which John and Messiah would enter into. And in verse 16, it says of John the Baptist, he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. Israel had turned away from the Lord. They turned to self-righteousness. They turned to religious devotion as a means to achieve a higher standing of spirituality, or at least so they thought. But their religious devotion to self-achievement had driven them far from God and deeply immersed them in personal satisfaction. They were pleased with themselves. Though the prophets had foretold of Messiah, that the people did not discern the Messiah, but must come to the Savior of their souls. What they wanted was a Messiah that would conquer and give them their nation back. But the prophets foretold of a different Messiah, one that they did not understand, nor did they immediately embrace. This is a Messiah that must come to them to be the Savior of their souls, not the Savior of their nation. And by the time that Jesus arrived, Israel wanted the Messiah to come and deliver them from the enemy Rome and ascend to the throne of Jerusalem and allow them as a people to be a free and independent nation once again. The Messiah they hoped for, the Messiah they saw in the Old Testament prophets and they looked for, would be a great soldier and a conquering king. But they did not envision a Messiah that would come to bring salvation, that would deliver them from their own sins and from a condemnation that those sins deserved. So hardened had Israel become in the sight of God that it was necessary for God to send before Messiah a forerunner that would go before and prepare the way for God's Son. And he would come in the spirit and power of Elijah, it says. The heart of this people was what needed to be turned, not their government, not their national freedom. The heart of the people needed to be turned. Their religious hearts needed to be broken under the conviction of their own depravity, and they needed to be brought to repentance and faith in a Savior other than themselves. So what Israel needed, according to this prophecy, was another Elijah. Remember, it was Elijah that that condemned the spiritual apostasy of Israel in his day. You would think of the the confronting of the pagan uh, prophets of Baal. He showed them to be false spiritual leaders who had led Israel astray to worship false gods. He called upon the powers of heaven to rain down fire who consumed the altar and and soaked up the blood or the the water in that that fiery uh, torment from heaven. Elijah then struck down the prophets of Baal 
with the sword, showing God's disdain for idolatry and the judgment that their sins deserved. This is the calling of God for this child that was given to Zacharias and Elizabeth, as described by the angel. He's going to come in that spirit, the spirit of Elijah. It was calling to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. And Zacharias and Elizabeth, they're divinely appointed here for the salvation that God is bringing into the world through his son. They're divinely appointed to have a part in that redemption. I think we may not always give the same recognition to these two old saints of God that we find here in the pages of scripture. But this is very much part of the Christmas story. This is an essential part. And it's here in Luke 1 that Zacharias and Elizabeth and their son John had an essential role in God's plan of redemption, which brings us to verse 18 down through 25, what I think of as an honorable correction. In this third section of this morning's text, we witness the response of Zacharias to this news. God had already chosen he and his wife and their son John to be a critical cast, an honored cast in this play of redemption. He had assigned to them an honored calling in raising and parenting this child, an honored calling to their son who would proclaim repentance and salvation through a coming Messiah. But here in this third section of the text, we witness the response of Zacharias to this news and the correction that the angel brings to that response. Zacharias is first frightened by the presence of the angel who reassures the troubled priest There's no need to fear here. I am bringing to you good news in answer to the many years of prayers for a child that you and Elizabeth have raised up to heaven. More than that, the angel brought the joyful news that God's salvation was about to unfold and the son that they were going to bring into this world was the promised one who would have an honored part in that salvation. He would go before Messiah, go before the Savior, And there's something, I think, of a contradiction in Zacharias' response in that God had found him and his wife to be righteous in his eyes. They had walked blamelessly before the Lord and according to the laws of God. But Zacharias was not a sinless man. And in verse 18, he questions the angel regarding the believability of this news. After all, Zacharias protests, Both he and his wife were old and well beyond the years of having children. Now at this point, the angel identifies himself by name and then moves to condemn Zacharias' misgivings. And you can almost hear the tone of voice in the angel who has a puzzled frustration in his words. I am Gabriel, he says. I'm the one that stands in the presence of God. I have been sent by God to you. To bring you this what? Good news. He's not coming with judgment. He's not coming with a a message of doom against Israel. He's coming with good news. Several things stand out in Gabriel's response. First, who who is this important messenger? He's coming with important truth. He's coming from an important God. And he, he highlights that. I am Gabriel. The angel of God. I stand in his presence. Zacharias, why are you not getting this? And we couple that with the fear that Zacharias had previously when he first saw Gabriel. He was an awe-inspiring sight. Clearly, this was not a mere man. Clearly, this was an angel from God. Zacharias understood that. So why, Zacharias, are you? Gabriel is saying. And then second, Gabriel came again with a miraculous gift of good news that should have validated that message, that should have validated even his presence. Because he's coming as this magnificent angel, I'm coming with good news. Now, Gabriel presents his credentials to Zacharias to confirm what was visibly obvious to this old priest. Gabriel's presence in the holy temple was a frightening thing to see, telling Zacharias, this guy's not from this world. This was an angel from God, and he comes with good news. And he tells Zacharias, I've come because your prayers have got to God have been answered here. 
This is a perfectly timed and glorious moment that would introduce God's plan of salvation. And this blazing angel had just announced the amazing news that this elderly couple were part of God's redemptive plan. They were going to have a son. This son is going to go before the Lord and have a transforming impact upon the world. And what is Zacharias' response? Mm, I'm pretty skeptical this can even happen. I don't believe. I suppose that many of us have been guilty of comparing the disbelief in Zacharias with what appears to be a similar account with Mary, who just a short time later is also going to be confronted by this very same angel, Gabriel. And she has some questions too, remember. When Gabriel said to her, you're about to conceive and bear a child, her response to Gabriel is, how can this happen? But there's a difference between Zacharias and Mary. Mary simply wants to know, how is this going to come about since I haven't been with a man? There's some mechanical things here that are missing. But with Zacharias, he is saying, I don't believe you. And we know that because that's exactly what Gabriel charged him with. He's saying to Zacharias, because you did not believe, though I am standing in your presence, an angel from God bringing good news to you, because you did not believe, this is now what's going to happen to you. I'm going to strike you as a mute. You're not going to be able to speak. And for the next nine months, for the pregnancy duration of your wife, you will have no words to say. Because Zacharias uttered words of disbelief, unbelief to God himself, God is answering by saying, I'm going to take your words away now for nine months. That's an appropriate chastisement. Zacharias simply did not believe the message sent to him by an angel from God according to Gabriel's own words. Now, my New American Standard translation adds added words to Gabriel's questions. How will I know this? And my Bible adds for certain. That really is emphasizing what Gabriel has told him you're guilty of, that of not believing. How will I know this for certain? In other words, I just don't believe. And it's because of that disbelief in the good news of God that Gabriel administers corrective measures that were appropriate for his disbelief. He then reminds Zacharias of the truth of this message. He said, what I've said to you will take place at the proper time. Zacharias then returned to the people that were gathered outside the temple courtyard the appearance of Gabriel had caused an obvious delay. They were waiting for Zacharias. He hadn't showed up. They're wondering what's going on. Unfortunately, Zacharias was now unable to explain what had taken place in that holy place. He is now silenced by the angel. And he's going to have to remain that way for several months. And apparently, Zacharias was able to make signs or gestures with his hands to the people that he'd seen a vision. And this portion of our Advent story ends with Zacharias returning home, which is a good thing because that's how his wife got pregnant. And she became, well, with a child. She, she had a child. She lived in seclusion, it says, for five months, only later to proclaim the blessing that she'd been given by the Lord. Now, here's another interesting detail. God had done this amazing thing for Zacharias and Elizabeth, but she goes in seclusion. She goes in hiding. Her disgrace has been ended. So why go in seclusion for five months? Well, I'm speculating here, and this might be just a, a, a detail that I've observed with my own wife being pregnant five times. But when you're first pregnant, you don't necessarily look pregnant, do you? You got a pooch. You look like you've been eating too much. And no doubt the community would have said, you need to back away from the table, Elizabeth, a little more. And she would have said, no, 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 no. I'm pregnant. Can you imagine the response of people? Yeah, sure. You're, you're barren and you're an old woman. You, you're just eating too much. Now, I'm speculating here, but she puts herself in seclusion until the appropriate time when she comes out and says, clearly now, this is a pregnant woman. It couldn't be denied. And her disgrace is removed. And she proclaims in verse 25, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor 
upon me. God was gracious to her. And after five months, she comes out of hiding, and it's very obvious that God has done a work of grace. It's the power of God again, the sovereignty of God, the work, the providence of God. This truly is a miracle. The hand of God has created this. And I suspect the better part of wisdom caused Elizabeth to lay low for those five months until it was rather obvious this is now a work of God. I'm a pregnant woman. God has shown his favor to me. At that time, she began saying to those around her, the Lord has looked with me with his graciousness, taken away my disgrace. She was not only going to have a son, but her son was going to be a special blessing to Israel and the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophet who wrote God's promise, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, before God. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, John, who will clear the way before me, Jesus Christ. Now, what do these things tell us? I'm, I'm largely retelling a story that's right in front of you on your laps in your Bible. What is this here for? What is it communicating to us? Why is this story so important, and what does it teach us today? And I want to offer just six what I think of as Christmas observations to bring about our worship time to a close this morning. Six Christmas observations. Number one, God is sovereignly active in all things. That should be obvious. God is sovereignly active in all things. Zacharias at first did not believe. How much do we believe that God is at work in all things in our lives? And do we trust him with those things? Do we trust him with the circumstances of our nation? Do we trust him with the circumstances of our church or our families or our marriages? Do we attempt too much control? Do we recognize the providence of God in all things in our lives? There's nothing in your life that God is not in control of. Do we trust him? Second, those used by God, those who are used by God for his glory, are also sanctified by him. Notice the two individuals that God selects for service here. These are ones that God has sanctified. He, the, he's working in their lives. They're walking blamelessly before God. They don't do that on their own discipline. It's God that does that sanctifying work in every sinner that he redeems for himself. He's the sanctifier. And while God is active in all things, including evil men like Herod, nonetheless, God is going to be glorified through those who are walking in his ways. Zacharias and Elizabeth were both righteous in the sight of God because God was at work sanctifying them. Philippians chapter 2. He was preparing these two people to be used for his glory. This is where we want to be as believers. Do you want to be used by God? Do you want the, the glory of God to be evident in your life? Do you want to serve him so the majesty of our Savior is known? Then be sanctified by him. This is an example to us, sanctified by God, used for his glory. This is where we want to be. Third, the blessing that comes from waiting on the Lord. We've got to see here the blessing that comes from waiting on the Lord. Our story is highlighting two older saints of God that have prayed for a child for years. And it's only when it is physically impossible to have children did God answer their prayers. And the answer that God gave them was not what they hoped for. Like any other younger couple, they wanted children when they were young. Like every other family in Israel. They didn't want that disgrace. God gave them a child, but only in their later years. They should have been grandparents or great-grandparents. But only in their later years did God answer that prayer to demonstrate his power and for his purposes. In other words, he told Zacharias and Elizabeth, I'm going to give you a son when it pleases me, and I'm going to use it for my purposes. For these two older saints... This, this is a time of humility and self-sacrifice. Not my way, Lord. Your will be done. Not what I anticipate for myself. Let me be used for your purposes. We may not always get what we ask for, 
But when God answers, we can be assured it will always be right. It will always be right. He answers our prayers according to his will. And fourth, the advent of God's nativity is evidence of man's darkness. It is evidence of man's darkness. Just the way that God is writing the preparation for the coming of his son acknowledges that Christ came into a dark world. With all of the color, the charm, and the joy of this season, it is so important that we do not forget why did God send his son? And why was a messenger necessary to go before that son? It reminds us just how sinful humanity is. The advent of Christmas story begins with people who are walking in darkness. And remember, as Zacharias prophesied, Christ Messiah, he's like the sunrise entering the scene where God's light begins to shine on a dark land. It is only when men and women come to this understanding and they cry out for a savior do they actually apprehend the joy of what God has done at Christmas, the nativity. John came into this world to preach sin and repentance. And those whom God was pleased to save, he opened their hearts, as he's done with us that are believers here this morning, opened our hearts to see their sin, to see our sin, and to believe in his son. And therefore, our task must be to preach the whole gospel. We've got to preach the whole thing. And it begins with the darkness of men's sin and the judgment that sin deserves. Otherwise, the Savior being born to us doesn't make any sense. Fifth, the pain and disgrace that God's people endure is never unprofitable in his hands. I think this is a point we so clearly need to see. The pain and disgrace that God's people endure is never unprofitable in his hand. What kind of pain are you going through? What kind of distress? What burden is on your heart right now? The word of God tells us that for his people, our God works all things together for good. Zacharias and Elizabeth experienced that. And look at the magnificent plan that God had for these two old people who couldn't have kids. This was so evident to these two. God's favor came and took that disgrace away, but only years later. And when we read God working this way in his word, does it encourage our hearts when we're experiencing pain and disgrace in life? Is there some purpose, in other words, for what you're going through, what you're feeling, what you're having to endure? It really takes our mind out of feeling sorry for myself and waiting upon the Lord. What does he have here? What's he doing here? There almost should be a sense of, of expectation that God is going to do some good work, even in the misery that I'm feeling for life's circumstance. God takes awful things, and he makes good of them. That's what our God does. And six, the whole of the, script, the Christmas story, the whole of the story is about a salvation that is received by faith. It's about a salvation that is received by faith. This is about a story about what God had to do for sinners because sinners could not do this for themselves. And that's why, again, we're emphasizing the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the miracles of God. God is doing here for these two older people. God is going to do for Mary what man could never do. It took a miracle. Salvation is all of God. And he brought this salvation to a people that says, well, no, no, we can work our salvation ourselves. We can do good things. We can live righteously. We can go to church we can, we can abide by the moral laws of God and we will be saved. And God is saying, no, salvation is all of me. I'm going to do the whole thing. You repent and put your faith in me. Put your faith in my son. God made all the preparations. God moved and directed for his purposes. And then God himself came to us to be our savior. He came to us to die for our sins. Salvation must be all of him. We are simply called to believe in what he has accomplished for us. Have you trusted him to save you? Have you trusted in his salvation? John was born by supernatural means. 
He was inhabited by the Spirit. It's all of God. The Savior came to our world through a virgin named Mary. All of God. And that son given to Mary, as we're going to see, is God himself. It's all of God. Salvation is by faith alone in what God has accomplished for sinners. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for a time of year. Though you have not ordained us to observe it, nonetheless, this is a memorial to the greatness of your love for sinners. The birth of your son, the nativity, is a memorial to the graciousness of our God to save those who are undeserving. It's a testament that our holy and righteous God came to a sin-filled, darkened people that didn't deserve salvation. But by your mercy and your grace and love, you reached out to humanity with a marvelous plan of salvation that you have accomplished all on your own by your power, by your righteousness. And by the moving of your spirit, you open our eyes to see the glory of the sunrise himself, your son, Jesus Christ. Well, Father, this morning as a people that have received that precious gift of faith, would you arouse us with a fresh excitement and zeal to represent that gospel, the whole of the gospel, to the world that is around us. Even with the harshness of the message of sin and darkness that men are in, even with the the difficulty of proclaiming that judgment comes for those that reject Christ, the whole truth needs to be told. And Father, we need a fresh courage and a fresh passion for the lost, a fresh love for sinners to communicate the glory of the Christmas story. Let it be for your honor that we do so in Christ's name. Amen.